Sonic. Sonic. Sofa. Sonic. Super. Sofa. Sonic. Sofa. Sonic. Sonic. Hello, welcome to Sofa Sonic 2020. My name's John Doran and I write about music. This talk is called Selected Ambient Walks. It's a play on words of which I'm inordinately proud. It refers to the debut album by the British electronic musician Richard D. James, made under his primary artistic alias Aphex Twin. The album, called Selected Ambient Works, 85 to 92, was the first music of his that I ever heard. It came out in early 1992 on Apollo, which is a subdivision of the Belgian rave label, r &S. This talk concerns a number of physical places associated with Aphex Twin and discusses these spaces as both heterotopias and interstices, as places of conflict between such notionally opposing forces as England and Cornwall, ruling class and working class, patriarchy and matriarchy, Christian dogma and pagan ritual. But really, I could have called this what I did on my holidays 2018, because that's essentially what this sideshow is. There I am there. I first went on holiday to Cornwall in 1972. And I've been going back about once every other year since. Uh, in August 2018, I spent a week with my family at St. Colin Minor, where my best friend Stu lives with his family. And in among the days out, bodyboarding at Porth Beach, playing the arcades in Newquay, going to the Eden Project, I decided there was going to be a dad day and the rest of the family were just going to have to suffer through it. We were going to visit as many Aphex Twin related places in Cornwall as we could fit in one day. Now at this point, I should probably point out for any pedants watching that yes, Richard D. James was not born in Cornwall. He's actually from Limerick in Ireland. And this is a significant thing, I think, and it will become a bit more significant in a second. But his parents moved there when he was very young. Apparently, he had an idyllic childhood. He grew up in a small village called Lanner and went to school in the nearby mining town of Red Ruth. Where James grew up is now one of the most impoverished places in Europe, but was, 150 years ago, one of the richest places in Europe. That's something, again, which I think is really significant. Aphex Twins' music is littered with direct references um, and indirect references to Cornwall, to which you might say, well, sure, he makes mainly instrumental music and these song titles have to be called something. I mean, one only has to look at a late period Otecker album to see that, you know, you can go massively off piste if you don't have a kind of a theme for naming your records. But I think, um, there's more to it than that, as the Cornish connection crops up quite a lot with him. The chat book, Walking the Music of Aphex Twin, written by George Butterworth, lists 18 direct references to Cornish place names in his music. And to be honest, there are a lot more now that we have the SoundCloud dumps. But it runs even deeper than this. His videos, press releases, and even record inserts like this one are littered with references not just to Cornish place names, but to Cornish mythology as well. 
This is an A4 paper insert that came with the original pressing of the Analog Bubble Bath Volume 3, which he released in 1993 under his AFX moniker on Reflex, the label he originally ran with Grant Wilson Claridge. The section marked Places of Interest in Cornwall is a playful mix of the all too concrete the authentically mythological and the completely fabricated, it draws together the King Harry Ferry, Hell's Mouth, the pirate ghost of Martin Trezida, the Mornan Smith Maze, and the intriguing but oddly ungoogleable Methane Princess. Compare this to his more recent press releases, such as the one from Syro, and you'll see that not much has changed. These missives, which come from James himself, I reckon, tend to act as an unruly riot of red herrings. They're written in a mix of English, Cornish, and outright gibberish. And in them, you can sense a professional lifetime of mischief created by an illusionist skilled in misdirection. Anyway, Armed with a stack of books on British and Cornish mythology, George Butterworth's guide, and an excellent essay written by the writer and editor Laura Snapes called The Wheel Thing, Aphex Twins Alternative Cornish Language, which was published on my website, The Quietest, I set off for Cornwall. The road to my first destination was littered with Aphex Twin related place names. I drove past the beach of Portreath and then through Redruth, leaving the town via the A30, taking the Scoria exit for the A3047. I was heading for the Gwenat Pit. The Gwenat Pit first enters the Aphex Twin narrative in 1993 on the Analog Bubble Bath Volume 3 packaging, which I just mentioned. The insert claims, this is an absolutely extraordinary location, renowned all over the Lanner area for its fabulous acoustics. It's also a great place for a swift game of TIG. I'm gonna assume that everyone knows what TIG is, and if perhaps you're watching from a non-UK country, just Google the word TIG instead. Then it re-enters the picture in 1999 as the eye-catching backdrop for an interview between John Peel, Richard D. James, and Luke Viber, aka Wagon Christ. Richard D. James is in typically mischievous mood. He tells the veteran Radio 1 DJ that when they hold raves there, the stone altar is where the record decks go. Then he makes an even more bold claim saying he had a job working in a tin mine at the age of 17. He says his pay packet went towards some of his first ever pieces of electronic music making hardware. Now this might be true, or it might be a typically Aphex in tall story, but either way, it's an important link for him to make between Cornish identity and his own music. He says that the mine was, and I quote, really really hot and grimy all the miners just walk around in their pants or just their belts and nothing else they just walk around in the nude these hard cornish miners with shovels and stuff i was well spun out most recently a computerized simulacra of the man-made excavation featured in the weird core video for the t69 collapse track and the descending concentric collapse pattern of the Gwenat pit was used elsewhere in the video on the artwork for the EP and in the international teaser campaign, all to great effect. One of the many things this Cornish landmark is, is a heterotopia, literally an other place. A world within a world, mirroring what is outside in a disturbing, intense, incompatible, contradictory or transforming way. The idea of the heterotopia was outlined by Michel Foucault 
in the preface to his 1971 work, The Order of Things. In its most simple and unsophisticated terms, if a utopia is a place where everything is perfect and a dystopia is a place where everything is bad, then a heterotopia is merely a place where everything is radically different. And again, in slightly simplistic terms, Foucault used the terminology to describe spaces that have more layers of meaning or relationships to other places uh, than initially meet the eye. He said that a heterotopia was a physical approximation of a utopia or parallel place that contained undesirable bodies in order to facilitate the utopia elsewhere, a prison um, or a ship that has a crew of press ganged men, uh, a chain gang. These places are all heterotopias. Um, New York in the John Carpenter film, Escape from New York, is a heterotopia. And so, uh, I think, is the Gwennat Pit. The Pit, when you get there, actually does have excellent acoustics. George Butterworth refers to it quite brilliantly, I think, as an early ancestor of the speaker cone. I felt it was hard not to think of it as a sound mirror pointed directly up at the sky, but it's actually a place of worship. Situated in Busville, a small satellite village of Red Ruth, it was the site of 18 John Wesley sermons held between 1762 and 1789. Now, if it looks far too curious and rarefied an excavation to deserve the nomenclature of pit, this is due to posthumous landscaping. The unnatural hollow was initially the site of subsidence from a large tin mine, and it became a rough and ready outdoor temple entirely because of Methodist practicality rather than grand design. John Wesley's inaugural sermon from the man-made dingle took place because the wind was too high for him to be heard in his intended location of Carharrick. His diary entry for September the 6th, 1762 reads, I stood on one side of this amphitheater towards the top and with people beneath on all sides, I enlarged on those words in the gospel for the day. Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see, hear the things that ye hear, adding, I shall scarce see a larger congregation till we meet in heaven. But it was just a muddy subsidence back then. And it was local miners who wrought its peculiar beauty after the death of Wesley as a kind of memorial to him, but also let's have it completely straight as a memorial or a celebration indeed of the financial success of the industry that they worked in. I said earlier about how nearby Red Ruth and Camborne are some of the poorest places in the country, but in 1840, uh, Gwenap was the richest mineralized area on the face of the known planet. And it was known internationally as the Copper Kingdom. The miners essentially formalized the pit with concentric tiers in 1806. The structure measured 16 feet deep and 360 feet in circumference. If you walk around every tier, the distance adds up to one mile. Is now. The actual Gwenap pit is 12 layers deep, not seven like in the video. The fact that the collapse video chooses seven is curious. You can hang almost anything on the number, se uh, on the number seven. I think people who smoke a lot of weed do tend to. Is this a reference to the elusive seventh Aphex twin album that might be on the way or might not be on the way? Or merely a nod to Dante's Inferno? Who knows? Just as the actual pit descends in stages, it has been through several symbolic stages of development itself. First, it was created by mining, then industrial accident, 
then it became an organic place of worship, then a symbol of pride, success and wealth, but now a partially deserted relic of a bygone age. But is that it? It may appear to be a bit of an oddity, a place for bored kids to hang out or the odd Aphex twin nutter to take a selfie in. And some of these Aphex twin nutters may make fanciful claims for it, being a heterotopia or a weird sand mirror or what have you. But really, what I think it is, is symbolic, a symbolic barrier between the new and the ancient. Because just under the surface of its healthy and well-tended turf is a plug of rock and earth above a collapsed mine shaft, hiding the pit's real history from view. And this should be expected because, as we know, the modern church is built on a much deeper and altogether more occluded pre-Christian belief system. The history of tin mining can be seen as a battleground between ancient and newer beliefs. The new beliefs cannot win outright or decisively, so the old ones are adapted. In the official Christian histories of the area, the discovery of rich seams of metal ore in the kingdom have been attributed to St Piran. He's the miner's patron saint. After traveling from Ireland to Cornwall about one and a half thousand years ago and building a chapel on the north coast, he constructed a fireplace out of beautiful rocks he discovered and he used a particularly striking slab of black rock as the pan on which he was going to make his fry up. Then, as he was cooking one day over a particularly fierce flame, he was amazed to see a stream of pure white molten metal flowing across the floor before solidifying. Cornish tin, as the official Christian version goes, had just been discovered. And according to the chapbook, popular romances of the West of England, collected and edited by Robert Hunt in the late 19th century, there was little doubt amongst the tin mining establishment of the area that not only was Gwenap the centre of Christianity, but that even St Paul himself had come to the mine to buy metal and to preach to local tin miners. But this doesn't get rid of the ample evidence that Phoenician merchants had been travelling to Cornwall to buy tin a thousand years before the birth of Christ. According to Robert Hunt, the merchants of Tyre traded with the Cornish for tin as far back as the reign of King Solomon. The true story remains buried as deep as a rich, ore-burring vein in the subterranean rock. One of the most obvious questions to ask then is not what did the Methodist preachers believe, and not what did the mine owners or tin exporters believe, what did the actual miners or tinners as they were known themselves believe? Well, among other things, they believed in goblins. According to Catherine Briggs in her excellent Encyclopedia of Furries, there are many different varieties of English mine goblin, and they are known by such names as the Goblin Owl, the Cutty Soames, and the Dunters. In Cornish tin mines, these beings who were never seen, but could be heard banging about lower down the mine, were known as knockers. They were thin limbed, about two foot tall, and they pretty much looked like miniature versions of the miners themselves. They worked in the deepest parts of the mine. Now, in some of the writing that I read whilst I was researching this uh, talk, they're described as being hook-nosed and one can't help but detect a certain anti-Semitic flavour to some of these myths. And true enough, in fact, according to Mark Alexander, who writes in British Folklore Myths and Legends, the knockers were regarded to be the spirits of the Jews who had crucified Christ and were now doing their penance below ground. However, it should be pointed out that as with a lot of the Cornish myths, there's a certain amount of confusion created 
created by the various tellings. And in regards to the folklore of the mines, at least, the Jew, the Saracen and the Phoenician, they seem to be interchangeable terms. And essentially, when people talk about Jew in a lot of, um, if, if people mention Jews in these myths, it seems to be a shorthand for people who have come from abroad to buy tin. The tin mine goblins were respected rather than feared or loathed. They weren't dangerous unless you upset them by whistling. And let's have it straight, people who whistle while I work are wankers. According to most sources, the knockers were quite benevolent if you fed them. Some miners who often proactively sought to appease them with offerings of food and candle wax. This offering became formalised in the tradition of throwing bits of Cornish pasty down mine shafts. Cornish pasty, or I guess just a pasty if you happen to be in Cornwall, as I'm sure you know, is one of the high watermarks of all human endeavour. It's essentially an edible lunchbox, and it's made from short crust pastry formed into a capital D shape with a curved rim of the D, which is heavily crimped, thick, folded pastry. The content of the pasty has become quite boringly and fiercely codified over the years and I believe, but don't at me haters if you think I'm wrong, it's made up of a filling of beef, onions, potato, sweet, salt and pepper. But originally um, it was a two pastry compartment device, one half filled with whatever meat and veg the household had in and the other half filled with a jam made from the stewed fruits. A two course meal in an edible lunchbox. Absolute genius. The miners used the thick pastry crimp as a handle, not because their hands were dirty, but because their hands could get covered in highly toxic arsenic. So this section would be cast away after the meal was finished. But in some mining communities, the pasties weren't cooked the night before in the home, but on the actual day and were delivered to the lip of the mine shaft by pasty vendors. The Cornish for pasty is hoggen, and this eventually became shortened to oggy. And it is believed that anyone dropping the food off would shout oggy, oggy, oggy down the mine shaft, which would gain the response oi, oi, oi in return. The cry of Oggy Oggy Oggy, Oi Oi Oi, was mystifyingly huge in this country, especially in the 1950s, 60s, 70s and 80s. It was adopted en masse by rugby league and football fans at a certain point in time. And if you're about the same age as me and you're from the north of England, you probably had numerous train and coach journeys absolutely ruined by oafs chanting this ridiculous phrase. Its use spread across the globe to many different countries, including Australia, Canada and France. It's mutated many times over to encompass the names of a number of celebrities. And in fact, has most recently been adopted by the fans of Ollie Murs. Ollie, 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 oi, oi, oi. However, my favourite mutation is the one that was used as the protest chant against Margaret Thatcher, who, of course, during her second term in office, decimated the minds of this country. And you could go to a protest probably held every single weekend where somebody would be shouting, Maggie, 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 out, out, out. So, when the pasties were delivered to the lip of the mine, to stop any mix-ups, they would have the respective miner's initials baked into the thick crimp. When the pasty was finished, the miner would take the thick crust with his initials on and sling it down the deepest recesses of the mine, where a knocker would presumably pick it up and feast on it, knowing exactly who it was who had fed him. 
In return, so it goes, the knockers would lead miners to new seams and warn them of danger. However, if you ever had heard the characteristic knocking of a Cornish mine goblin overground, the rules were different and it often meant tragedy was on its way. There are numerous stories to illustrate the folly of any Cornish person foolhardy enough to ignore the ominous knocking of goblins when heard overground. Cornish miners, by the way, shipped their tin abroad from only a handful of coastal areas, two of which were Perrin Porth, the beach mentioned on the Analog Bubble Bath Volume 3 insert, and St Michael's Mount, which are both Aphex Twin heterotopias. to Gwenat Pit, I drove west along the A30 for half an hour and arrived at the very picturesque St Michael's Mount, a small tidal island in Mount Bay which is linked to the coastal village of Marazion at low tide by a granite footpath. Marazion gets its name because there used to be a synagogue there hundreds of years ago. Its Cornish name is Carrick Luz and Cuz which means the ancient rock in the woods. And some evidence has been found at low tide of an ancient hazel forest dating back to 1700 BCE. But who put this giant rocky outcrop there in the first place? Well, giants, obviously. According to folklore myths and legends of Britain, and I quote, in the days before the sea claimed Mount Bay, the giant Cormoran and his giant wife Cormelian lived in the forest. One day they decided it would be safer to live in a stronghold built out of white granite rocks. To this end, they began transporting the stones to the site where St Michael's Mount stands today, Cormelian using her apron to carry her load. They had an odd relationship, Cormelian and Cormoran. When Cormoran was out of sight of his wife, the work shy bastard that he was, he stretched himself out for a doze. Cormelian in turn was really happy when she saw Cormoran snoozing, as this meant she could collect ordinary rocks which were much closer to hand. When her husband woke up, he was outraged to see her struggling past, her apron bulging with green stone rocks instead of the white granite that they'd agreed on. He jumped up to his feet and expressed his displeasure by giving her a kick up the backside so powerful it caused her apron strings to snap. The rocks she had been carrying spilled out and remain where they are to this day, making up the causeway to St Michael's Mount. Now, as you've probably guessed, Cormelian didn't have a particularly good time of it. Cormoran was friendly with a neighbouring giant called Tricobin and they shared the use of a gigantic hammer. They would throw the hammer to one another when it was needed. One day, Cormelian ran out to watch Tricobin throwing the hammer. She was temporarily blinded by the sun in her eyes and failed to see it flying through the air towards her. It hit her, square in the face, and killed her. The noise of the two male giants grieving caused a tempest. They lifted the chapel rock at the apex of St Michael's Mount and buried her under that. Cormoran didn't have much good luck himself. He was the first of many victims of Jack the Giant Slayer. He of the magic beans and preposterous beanstalk. But just as the body of Cormelian was laid to rest under the religious settlement on St Michael's Mount, as always, if you dig down into the structure of the church, you find a continuity with the pre-Christian past. 
There is evidence that the mount was occupied by humans as far back as either the Neolithic or Mesolithic period. According to Robert Hunt, when Saxon rule and extended beyond the Tamar into Cornwall, it was noted that the hill seemed to already be the residence of an anchorite or religious recluse. And apparently this recluse must have been very, very holy indeed, as he'd been visited by the angel St. Michael himself, who apparently expressed a fondness for hilltop churches. So a church was built and dedicated to him, and possibly a monastery as well in the 8th century, although no one's quite sure. Now, if you forgive this brief digression, it really is remarkable how many saints, high-ranking saints and angels, managed to visit um, Cornwall from either the Middle East or heaven itself, um, presumably on their holidays. After all, Cornwall is beautiful. But these, this list, and this is not an exhaustive list, includes Joseph of Arimathea, St. Michael, St. Paul. And if you read uh, and did those feet in ancient times by William Blake, even his nibs, Jesus Christ himself visited Cornwall on his way to his final destination, Glastonbury. Now, a more cynical person than me might be tempted to suggest that there were some Middle Eastern tin traders visiting Cornwall to buy tin who displayed a fairly blasphemous sense of humour when talking to credulous locals in the tin mining industry. Who, me? Well, my name's St. Michael, but you can call me Mike if you want. Is there any chance of a discount? Anyway, churches and chapels were often built outside of their parish village on the highest point that could be re easily reached, where they would provide ley lines with their marking or terminal points. There are several instances of chapels being built on rocks or small islands off the coast being the endpoints of ley lines. There isn't enough time to get into it here, but should you be interested in following it up, Walter Johnson in Byways in British Archaeology devotes hundreds of pages of evidence to the idea that old churches were frequently built on pagan sites, which are on ley lines. And talking of these places being heterotopic mirrors and of the Archangel Michael's um, love for hilltop churches on coastal islands being dedicated to him we need to end this section by mentioning the mirror image of saint michael's mount across the sea mon san michael this is a rocky coastal island off normandy that was formerly a home to a religious anchorite that went on to have a monastery built there in the 8th century and of course both are mentioned in the 2001 Aphex Twin track, Mont Saint Michel, St. Michael's Mount. <laughs>visiting the picture postcard perfect St Michael's Mount I traveled further out west past Penzance along the A30 then down the B3283 to the village of Treen and for the final destination of my short trip the Logan Rock now for years I used to call this geographical site of interest the Logan Rock but a nice man in a cafe who works just around the corner from it, who was wearing a nine stairs and Neubarten t-shirt, assures me it's called the Logan Rock. And I assume it's pronounced that way because it's a bastardized version of the logging rock. To log, as Laura Snipes pointed out in her Wheel Thing essay for the quietest, in Cornish dialect means to rock or sway like a drunk. And that's exactly what this massive granite boulder used to do.
it was balanced so exquisitely that it led to the saying, and I quote, so great is the log and rock that many men's united strength cannot remove it, yet with one finger you may wag it. So it's a very dis precise descriptor. It's a rocking stone. It sits on top of a large rocky outcrop on a cliff top, a couple of miles outside Treen, and it's nicknamed the castle. There are plenty of other rocking or logging stones or logan stones all over the British Isles, by the way. And the term is a generic one, but this one, the log and rock, I think is probably the, the most famous or the most notable at least. The rock doesn't look that big in photographs, but it's massive and it weighs 80 tons. Just to give you a bit of an idea how big it is. If you look closely at this image here, you can just about see a person who has climbed up the cliff face to get a closer look at the rock. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that this person is an idiot. And if we zoom in a bit further again, we can see that the idiot is looking quite dismayed. And all I'll say about that is the following. If you happen to be a sedentary and unfit 49 year old writer with literally no previous rock climbing experience and a fear of heights, if I were you, I'd probably just admire the log and rock from the ground. However, if you suddenly happen to think, fuck it, and decide to climb up the cliff face to take a closer look at the boulder perched at the top of it on a whim, I would ensure I had more appropriate footwear on than shiny sole Dr. Martin's shoes. And if you go ahead wearing Dr. Martin's shoes, which are shiny soled and very slippy, you should expect to also slip over a few times and cut your arms to shreds. And then when you get to the top, I'd expect you to end up looking quite miserable and sorry for yourself when it was time to have your photograph taken. According to William Bottrell's Traditions and Hearthside Stories of West Cornwall, Volume 2, compiled in the 19th century, the wizard Merlin lived here. He said that the log and rock, or men amber as it was known then, was raised, fully formed out of the sea, by enchantment and placed in a significant position atop the castle. The whole structure was protected and kept in place by a much smaller magic rock known as the key of the castle. The key of the castle was a three foot long egg shaped stone trapped inside the cavity of another rock. It's a relatively well known anomaly and this type of nodule was known to miners and geologists of the day as a pig's eye or a bull's eye. Very few people had ever seen the key as it was situated near the bottom of a deep chasm called the Gap, which could only be seen at low tide and required a sure-footed climber of strong nerve to reach it. But even if you did reach it, no one could move it. Even though it looked like there should have been enough space to lift the nodule clear, the gap wasn't quite big enough. This was just as well, because according to Merlin, at least, if anyone removed the key of the castle successfully, the whole castle would fall into the sea and great calamity would come to the whole area. Just to recap, that's great calamity to the whole area. But between the immovable boulder and the unreachable key, the Cornish were safe from great calamity until the bloody English turned up and ruined everything. In 1754, speaking of the log and rock, the Cornish geologist, Dr. William Borlase claimed, perhaps with a whiff of hubris, that the while the chunk of the igneous stone could be rocked, it would never roll. And I quote, it is morally impossible that any lever or indeed force, however applied in a mechanical way, can remove it from its present position. Taking this as a challenge both to himself and the Royal Navy, 
on April the 8th, 1824, Lieutenant Hugh Goldsmith and a dozen crew members from the HMS Nimble, armed only with bars and levers, managed to rock the log and rock until it fell off the cliff. Angry residents pointed out that the log and rock was one of the only things that drew tourists to the region and demanded that it put, be put back. Mr. Davies Gilbert persuaded the Lords of the Admiralty to loan Lieutenant Goldsmith the apparatus for replacing the rock. Mr. Gilbert found the necessary money, a fortune by today's standards. And in November 1824, I quote from him, I had the glory of replacing the immense rock in its natural position. All in all, the action took several months of effort by over 60 men. Anyone foolhardy enough to climb up to see the rock today will still be able to see the drill holes in the boulder where it was attached to the apparatus, but they won't be able to rock it as, guess what, they didn't put it back properly. Of course the people of Trian had every right to be annoyed. Not only was the log and rock renowned and drew people to the area, but it was believed to have intrinsic powers. It had very deep spiritual significance to people who lived near it. Should parents need to, they could place a poorly infant on top of the log and rock and sway it in order to cure a weakling child. So not only did the boulder not rock once it was restored, but the spell was broken, so it no longer had healing powers. Now, of course, the sailors, bunch of fucking drunks that they were, could have gone home, but oh no. While they were putting the log and rock back, someone told them about the key of the castle. Few people had ever descended the cliff to enter the gap at low tide. It was far too dangerous and the key of the castle had remained pretty much a mysterious object until Goldsmith's sailors turned up, that is. They took a boat out to the gap and using crowbars, they broke away the edges of the rock that enclosed the key, they ripped it out and they dropped it into the sea. And this is why we can't have nice things. But if we read Robert Hunt, we'll learn that over the years, the rock hasn't just been a magnet for spiteful drunk sailors and idiot writers, but also for witches. It's wise when uh, reading all of these um, accounts of witchcraft to bear in mind that they were all written by men, or at least the ones that I um, read were. He says, and I quote, no one can say for how long a period, but most certainly for ages, this peak has been the midnight rendezvous for witches. Many a man and woman too, now sleeping quietly in the churchyard of St. Levin, would, had they the power, attest to have seen the witch flying into the castle peak on moonlit nights, mounted on stems of ragwort and bringing with them the necessary things to make their charms potent and strong. According to official sources, the St. Levin witches were feared and despised. They gathered at the Log and Rock, which they would use as a home base, apparently for attacking Welsh farms, and also a vantage point to spy out struggling ships in order to brew up tempests to wreck them. Their booty would be the jewellery stolen from the corpses of drowned sailors. Now I choose to see the Log and Rock as a battleground between the invading English Christian patriarchy and an older resident Cornish matriarchy. And in my head, this battle has a potential soundtrack in the shape of the Richard D. James album. Listen to the whole thing, including the track to cure a weakling child, and you end up on Log and Rockwich, which is my favourite Aphex Twin track. Now, if you take a quick look at Rate Your Music, it reveals that it's not well loved by all Aphex Twin fans by any stretch. And that's probably because some of the comedic sounds that typify it. But this isn't so much a mixture of the sublime and the ridiculous rather than the sublime conjured from the ridiculous. James relies heavily on the sound of two of the most disregarded and humble instruments he can find. 
the lowly jaw harp, and the signifier of all pratfalls, the swanee or slide whistle. When you add this to the non sequitur of peal of church bells and that other noise, which might as well be a shatterproof ruler being thwoing against a desk lid by a mischievous school child, then we're not exactly talking deconstructed house or something cool you're going to hear in the Berghain. To my ears, however, these noises combine with sombre organ and staccato synths in a tapestry that is beguiling, bone chilling and moving when taken as a whole. I can't help but hear a mournful funeral march played on all the instruments left behind by children who were unlucky enough to fall victim to the St. Levin witches, annoyed at centuries of incursion into their territory its shuffling pace reflecting some slow nighttime procession to the top of the cliffs. To me, this song casts Richard D. James not as a West Country rave innovator, but the contemporary version of a Cornish droll teller. The type of peripatetic bard, musician and gossip monger who used to travel from town to town and village to village, swapping stories and entertainment in return for food, drink and board before disappearing the next day and in the process, keeping the folk history of Cornwall alive. Thanks very much for listening. Um, we're going to listen to Log and Rockwich now. Normally, um, if I was doing this live, uh, I'd offer to answer a few questions at the uh, conclusion of the song. And, by the magic of the internet, I can do that. You know, I'm going to be on Twitter after, directly after this, and you can find me as Jar Duran, J A H D U R A N, and probably you should uh, at uh, Supersonic Festival and maybe put hashtag SofaSonic on there as well. And if anyone wants to, we can have um, a conversation about AFX Twin and his music. And I should straight say straight up, I'm not an expert on his music by uh, any stretch of the imagination, but I do like chatting about him. Let's listen to Logan Rockwich. <laughs> John Doran, uh, thanks very much for watching and listening.
You can read a lot more about the Apex Twin on my website, uh, The Quietus. We've got a bunch of really brilliant um, features up there. I want to say thanks, um, firstly, to Natalie Sharp, uh, whose face you've seen adorned with um, Apex Twin uh, imagery through this talk. I want to say thank you to Barney Roundtree. Um, I made a documentary on Apex Twin with Barney for Radio 4 a couple of years ago, and a couple of these ideas were kicked around by me and him in that process, so thanks to Barney. I definitely want to say thanks to the inspirational Lisa Mayer, brilliant woman. Praise be to Capsule and the whole Supersonic crew, and special thanks to Bridge Williams for his technical help. Bye.